Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, and welcome to Global Insights, a live interactive panel discussion which sheds light on big questions currently facing planners, policymakers, and researchers worldwide. Global Insights features experts from leading schools of international affairs, including the Balsillie School in Canada, American University in Washington, Warwick University in the UK, Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto, Japan, ISA in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and Constance University in Germany. Today's live stream production is entitled The Future of Peace and Conflict, Nuclear Arms, Space and Robotics. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsili School, and I'm delighted to be serving as moderator for today's session. A warm welcome to all of you in the audience. If you have any questions for the panelists towards the end of the session, please feel free to direct those using the Q&A function on your Zoom panel, and we will do our best to channel those to the appropriate panelists. Before we begin today, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those of you in the audience who are tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the steps that we take to advance reconciliation between settler and indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts our work. Acknowledging the land is the process of naming that this is the indigenous land and that indigenous peoples have right to this land. The Balsili School is situated on the Haldeman track, the land promised to the Six Nations, which is the traditional on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that we here at the school acknowledge the land on which we are situated in everything we do, including Global Insights. We're privileged today to host four well-known experts on issues related to nuclear space uh, and technology. Melissa Hannum is the Deputy Director of Open Nuclear Network, a program of One Earth Future and also directs its Detayo project. She is an expert on weapons of mass destruction, which include nuclear, chemical and biological weapons and their delivery devices such as missiles and bombers. Audrey Kurth Cronin is an academic practitioner and award-winning author. Currently, she is director for the Center for Security, Innovation and New Technology and professor at the American University. Her most recent book, Power to the People, How Open Technological in Innovation is Arming Tomorrow ter Tomorrow's Terrorists, published by the Oxford University Press, was a Foreign Affairs Best of 2019 uh, award winner and was shortlisted for the Lion Lionel Gelber Prize and the Ari Neve Prize. Branka Marian is a senior researcher at Project Plowshares. At Plowshares, Branka leads the research on military and security implications of emerging technologies. Jessica West is a senior researcher at the Canadian Peace Research Institute, Project Plowshares, and managing editor of International Space Security Index Project. Her research and policy work is focused on technology, security, and governance. Jessica interacts regularly with uni key United Nations bodies tasked with space security. And I should also add that both Jessica and Branka are PhD graduates of the Balsili School. So welcome to all panelists. Delighted to have you here today. I want to start with a question concerning the threat of weapons of mass destruction, a threat which has been with us now for decades but is taking on a new sense of urgency because of technological advances. So I'd like to spend a few minutes on this issue and start with you, Melissa. What kinds of nuclear weapons are there today and who has them? Thank you very much for having me, Anne. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with such esteemed colleagues. Uh, nuclear weapons, as you said, are not new. They've been around for decades. Uh, the US tested its first nuclear weapon 75 years ago and also use them on the country of Japan. Today, uh, when we think of nuclear weapons possessors, there are the Security Council members, which are recognized um, possessors of nuclear weapons. So the US, Russia, China, France, and the UK. Um, but in addition, there have been several new countries who have joined the nuclear weapons club, so to speak, and that includes India, Pakistan, Israel, although it's not officially 
claimed so by official sources, and then North Korea is the newest addition. The types of nuclear weapons range from enormous meg megatons uh, yield down to low yield weapons, uh, including one that is proposed by the US government uh, that it's um, considering even testing in the near future. So there is a wide variety of types of nuclear weapons and states that already have them and may seek to have them in the future. Thank you, Andrea. I'd like to come to you and ask you about innovation in this digital age that we're living. And um, is this very different than what was experienced during the 20th century? Yes, and I think that there is a sharp distinction between the kind of innovation that we had in the 20th century and what we're seeing today. In the 20th century, we had um, elites and specialist programs, mainly state supported, that developed things like nuclear weapons or satellites or radar. And those things were expensive, rare, difficult to build, and they required the resources of a state and they were protected by things like security clearances and secret labs. But in about 1993, uh, the United States and other countries released a lot of the technologies that had been developed in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and uh, shared them in the 90s. And so things like the internet, GPS, uh, smartphones, the elements of smartphones like microchips and touch screens and voice activated systems, these were all developed originally in uh, government programs. And now they're driven by commercial processes and they're specifically designed to be tinkered with. So digital technologies are causing broad ranging societal changes. And the change I think is much faster than the changes that occurred in the 20th century with nuclear weapons and more state controlled weapons, more militarily driven wep weapons. Open innovation in the digital age is a lot less predictable, I believe. Thanks very much, Branka. Your research, I think, focuses on autonomous weapon systems. Um, what, are, what are the concerns about developments in this area? So thanks, Anne, and so glad to be joining you all today. Um, Audrey is absolutely correct in saying that advances in technology, which are allowing machines to scan larger amounts of data more quickly, improvements in robotics and availability of sensors, for example, are pushing forward the changes in hardware that are available to militaries. So all of that is leading to a key concern, which is really the diminishing human control over these weapon systems. And Audrey is also correct to note that now many of these developments are happening in civilian labs, right? So you can think of research on autonomous vehicles, for example, uh, the Google car, right? This is resulting in a techno optimism then for some militaries, uh, the greater autonomy of weapon systems would provide them with an edge over other countries. But this lack of human control over these systems has multifaceted legal, ethical, humanitarian, and security implications. You know, a common uh, question to ask is who will be held accountable for decision making of autonomous systems, right? And many more. So another challenge with autonomous weapons maybe that differs from some of the other weapons mentioned and that we'll discuss is that it, it will be difficult to count them, right? Or to know when a system has been deployed autonomously. That is, if there really was a human with some significant control over the system or if the system was functioning autonomously. This could simply be a matter of software being used on a different platform, right? That, you know, a few lines of code would separate the type of weapon being used autonomously or semi-autonomously or with human control. Thanks so much. And Jessica, your research focuses on space. Um, it, it, the concept of space wars is something that's always been saved for science fiction. Um, are there wars in space? What's up there? Um, space has long played a supporting role in conflict. Uh, that's not new. Um, but in recent years, space has emerged in the minds of many as a domain of warfare in its own right. And this is new. We know that electronic warfare, things such as the jamming of satellite communications is already rampant. In the last decade or so, we have seen three states demonstrate a hit to kill anti-satellite capability in space, most recently India just last year. And there's evidence that um, the development of other anti-satellite capabilities, such as directed energy weapons or lasers, is accelerating. And um, we see that a number of states are actively preparing for warfare in space. 
Now, I'm sure that many in the audience are familiar with the United States Space Force, and while Steve Carell turned that into a caricature on Netflix, I assure you that it's not a farce, and it's not alone. You know, Japan, France, the United Kingdom, India, many states are grappling with the question of how to protect themselves in the space domain. So while it's not quite Star Wars-esque, the situation right now is incredibly dangerous and fragile. So during the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union based their arms race on the principle of um, mutually assured destruction, which of course can be applied to all sorts of conventional and non-conventional weapons. So Andrea, I want to come back to you and ask, can we gain any insights from history about today's emerging technology, or is all this new? Well, um, that's an easy one, yes. Uh, we can gain a lot of insight from history. And in particular, uh, I think the last time we had an open technological revolution is crucial to learn lessons from, and that would be the latter part of the 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, uh, we, the third uh, industrial revolution was maturing. And just like today, there were a lot of changes in global patterns of uh, technological innovation, trade, and communication. And um, just like today, anyone can purchase drones or build uh, primitive quadcopters or even primitive gene splicing kits. During the late 19th century, they could buy cheap wiring kits, uh, high explosives, chemicals, along with the instructions from brand new journals that were specifically designated for amateurs like Popular Science and Scientific American. And so from the latter part of the 19th century emerged things like the radio that was built by Marconi in his attic. You had high explosives that were invented by Al Albert no Nobel. Um, and all of these things, uh, Alfred Nobel, and all of these things became extremely important later in the First and the Second World Wars. Orville and R Wilbur Wright, you know, flying their from their bicycle shed developing the first sustained uh, and controlled flight in 1903. So it's what I worry about is that we have this tendency to separate what is happening in commercial life from what is happening in state controlled and state driven innovation because what happened in the first and second world wars very much reflected the period of open innovation at the latter part of the 19th century. Thanks so much. Melissa, over to you. Are, are nuclear weapons still relevant or have emerging other threats um, eclipsed them? I think nuclear weapons are still very relevant. I, I perhaps I'm a little bit biased, but I absolutely believe that developing technologies are in some ways changing the way people think about implementing nuclear weapons or disarming nuclear weapons. And a lot of the uh, work that's done by my, my fellow panelists uh, really intersects with nuclear weapons. I think the, the first point really to make is that nuclear weapons remain uh, the largest, the most immediate existential threat to humans on Earth. So when we think about what a weapon of mass destruction is, it's, it's usually categorized by the amount of death it can, it can, um, it can cause. And uh, I think for maybe too many years, we've thought about autonomous weapons tech and um, cyber weapons as being weapons of mass disruption rather than destruction. And that's a fair point perhaps, but uh, because of the intersection with nuclear weapons, uh, it, it really is a very combustible situation. But the, the other point I'd like to make is that, um, you know, this technology is not only for evil. Um, I think Audrey made a lot of really great points about innovation and particularly civilian innovation. And so um, one of the things that I think is enormously important for space and autonomous systems is the ability to uh, oversee monitor arms control weapons, uh, arms control agreements to monitor and verify treaties uh, that states come uh, together to agree upon. It doesn't change political will, but it can build trust in a way that, uh, you know, is, is uh, verifiable by all rather than just a few with national technical means. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Jessica, um, space is far away. And aside from uh, a few astronauts, the International Space uh, Station, it is populated with hardware as opposed to human life. On this basis, how likely is the conflict in space? And what should we be concerned about? 
Well, I think we should be concerned because unfortunately there are many paths to mutual destruction in space. Um, I really appreciate Melissa's point and picking up on that. It's critical to remember that you know, the first of these paths is nuclear. Command and control, early warning, and arms control verification for nuclear weapon systems all run through space. These systems are incredibly vulnerable. The United States has specifically linked interference with some of its sensitive military satellites to its nuclear deterrent strategy. Uh, the other path to mutual destruction in space is through mass contamination of the environment. What goes into space stays in space. When those things break apart, the clouds of debris that they create also stay there. Those little pieces can then collide with other objects in space, creating a cascade of damage that can really make key orbits that we depend on unusable. It, you know, imagine never being able to clear the wreckage and the shrapnel off of Highway 401 in Canada. It would be a disaster. And so while accidental collisions can and have taken place, the intentional destruction of objects in space really is a key source of contamination. You know, China's anti-satellite test in 2008 created the largest debris field to date, and it's still up there. So while there may not be many people in space, billions of people around the world are connected to these systems and rely on these systems. Cell phone service, airline traffic, disaster warning, agriculture, shipping, the internet. Basically, our entire lives are linked to space now. Thanks. Bronco, over to you. Um, over the last six years, there's been ongoing discussions uh, in different UN fora uh, focused on um, the regulation of uh, autonomous weapon systems and things like killer robots. Where do these discussions stand at the moment? So there are actually ongoing discussions uh, on autonomous weapons happening this week in Geneva, both in person and virtually. And in the first, due to the pandemic, you can also follow these discussions on UN Web TV. So you can see what researchers in this field suffer through. Um, so something, this is something that Russia opposed though, you know, this kind of broadcasting of these discussions um, and is indeed not attending these meetings. So if you want to understand the great power of politics. Um, the discussion though seems to be stalling as most advanced militaries do not seem to want to place any limitations on the types of auto autonomous systems that they can deploy. And there, you know, over 32 countries have called for a ban on these uh, systems, but they do not include major militaries, right? There's also 17 guiding principles that countries have agreed to and, the, and discussed, and they're still kind of debating them. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where this leads, but it does include a support for human oversight of, of these systems. The issue at hand though, and I think this is something Melissa touched upon is, there is a real need to build trust among countries uh, that if they give up, right, these systems, if they do support a ban, that others will as well. And indeed that it is in their interest to do so because of the impacts on the global security environment of these systems. As Melissa uh, rightly pointed to, you could, you know, these kinds of systems could use any platform. You could put any type of uh, weapon type on a system, right? So, you know, we're really talking about a, a widespread impact on global security. So the reality is though, for countries to recognize that as they're, you know, they have the edge in the technology as long as they're the only ones that have it uh, with these weapons. And that is unlikely as, you know, Audrey has laid out and others for those various reasons, that is unlikely to be a uh, case for long for at least the major militaries. So building on this last point then, um, let's look at what can be done to mitigate the harm or any potential harm uh, posed by these weapons and weapon systems. And Melissa, I'd like to come back to you um, to ask about the issue of nuclear weapons. Are states still developing nuclear weapons? Yes. Um, and, and you know, in my opinion, unfortunately, there are still uh, states that are seeking nuclear weapons programs and uh, there are still existing states that have nuclear weapons that are uh, adapting existing programs. Some of this is needed to keep uh, old systems uh, viable. So, for example, in the US, uh, even through the Obama administration, there was a program of modernization which was very strongly disliked by outside countries. But the underlying theory was that some of the physical components of the warheads, particularly plastic and uh, electrical components, just age out and they need to be replaced in order to be safe. And um, 
usable. Um, but the Trump administration is taking this even farther. They've announced the possibility of a low yield weapon in their nuclear posture review. And um, this is really set off um, a firestorm in the world about what it means for a state which has signed the NPT and agreed to disarm to actually build new weapons. The theory behind this low yield weapon is that it's just a little nuclear weapon. And so uh, it gives you options where, uh, you know, maybe another state would choose not to retaliate nuclear with nuclear weapons. Um, there's no theory to back that up, um, although there's a lot of um, pontificating on the subject, I would say. A uh, nuclear weapon is always a new nuclear weapon, no matter how big or small it is. Um, so uh, right now, I think for people who are considering um, what it would be like to have a low yield a nuclear weapon tested, particularly indigenous people and downwinders in Nevada, um, you know, have the opportunity to reach out to their elected officials to, to raise their concern if they are concerned about it. Um, or uh, I think we as uh, academics or former academics uh, also have to really examine whether this fits into the use cases that we have in mind for conflict now. Um, is a lower yield nuclear weapon more usable? And is that good um, based on our, our security outlook? Uh, I obviously have a very strong opinion of my own, but, but it's something that should be discussed uh, as other weapons developments are. Thanks very much. Audrey, back to you on the spread of today's emerging technologies. How does this spread differ from the proliferation of nuclear weapons? Yes, I think there are fundamental differences, but let me first say uh, to Melissa that I agree with you that nuclear weapons are a serious problem and nothing that I'm about to say takes anything away from that. And I'm also concerned um, that we're moving back toward more usable nuclear weapons. It sounds a lot like we're going back to the 1950s and 60s with the whole tactical nuclear weapons that we abandoned back then. So great work, I'm sure, that you're doing, and uh, bravo. But back on the question that I meant to answer, I think that innovation today is not so much like proliferation uh, that we use those kinds of frameworks for nuclear weapons. I think it's more like diffusion. There's a far, at least when it comes to open technologies, there's a far broader range of people involved instead of just military and civilian and using a, a kind of a dual use framework. I think we need to look at uh, a range of people like professionals, prosumers, hobbyists, and then individual consumers who are innovating with these technologies. We still need to focus on the technologies that elites are building. I think it's very important to focus on what's happening, for example, between the United States and China with respect to AI. But we also need to consider low-end technologies because they're causing broader societal change and they're affecting patterns of conflict already. I think we need to pay attention also to what is coming from below. Uh, and I don't think we do that enough. Franca, what, in your view, does a world without regulation over these systems look like? Yeah, I guess you would say it would be dystopian, but, you know, we're already living through so many different dystopian uh, novels and scripted scenes in real time. But, yeah, I think, it, you know, Audrey's absolutely correct to say that the growing competition among leading militaries such as the United States and China in emerging technologies in particular um, in, in the field of AI, I, it means that these are not distant concerns, right? Uh, we could see the deployment of unreliable systems or systems with unpredictable, unpredictable outcomes as countries start fielding these uh, types of weapons without real constraints, right? Uh, you know, the ICRC and others have come out to say that existing laws of war are not sufficient to capture the kinds of challenges being posed by autonomous systems. And this is why we need to bolster um, our you know, laws of war to really be able to adequately capture the widespread impact these weapons would have. And I think the point to stress really, you know, we're talking about, you know, we mentioned this several times, dual use technologies. You know, when we look at autonomous systems, we're really looking at multi-use technologies, right? Different components are going to come from different fields. Um, and obviously, we pay a lot of attention to AI and some of it is hype. But other aspects and other developments are um, something worth taking note of um, because it, it does entail a real transformation, I think, of, of global security. And I'll speak to that maybe a bit later as well. 
Great, thanks very much. And um, Jessica, I want to push you back on this weapons in space issue. Um, are there weapons in space? You know, what's driving the risk of their proliferation up there? Great question. Until fairly recently, I was pretty confident in being able to say, no, there are not currently weapons orbiting in space. This is what we're trying to prevent. Today, I'm less sure. There are certainly things in space that could be used as weapons. Um, so we've already mentioned dual use and Bronca expanded that to multi-use and the same situation exists in space. And uh, I think it's this potential for the multiple use of objects in space um, and the uncertainty of intentions behind different objects that are in orbit that is driving a lot of the growing insecurity. Um, over the last year, the United States military has certainly accused Russia on numerous occasions of having tested various weapon systems. Uh, the latest was um, a shooting of a projectile from a satellite this past July. You know, this is difficult for people to verify, but if true, it could mark the first shot having been fired in space. Um, what I do know is that space is deeply entwined with really what is a, a global arms race that stretches across all domains of military activity. Um, weapons located on Earth have been tested against satellites in space. And I would say right now, um, I also feel like Audrey, that we're back to the 1950s and 60s when there's a lot of development and experimentation with space technology with, uh, that has potential weapons use. And unfortunately, efforts to either ban weapons or restrain the use of force matter space have been stalled for, I think it's almost four decades now, which is really quite a shame. Um, so sadly, we're at a point where there's a lot of new technology and there are no rules. I want to uh, look at how these weapons and weapon systems can be potentially governed effectively. And I would underline the word effectively here for us to concentrate on. So Audrey, let's start with you on this question. How are emerging technologies already changing the character of war? Well, there are big changes underway and they can be hard to see because we're, we're looking very much at, at large technology systems and not seeing the broad societal effects. But um, there are three main ways, I believe, that uh, conflict is already changing as a result of digital technologies. The first one does get a lot of play, and that is um, how people mobilize. So how they use so social media or other means of connectivity, internet platforms, chat rooms, and so on, for both good and ill how um, we how they get attention, how they develop uh, you know, psychological incitement in other people, but also physical mobilization. Um, these things are really changing and uh, it's an important dynamic when it comes to war and peace because mobilization used to be much more, particularly in the 20th century, early 20th century, it was much more of a state uh, function. That's long behind us. The second big way though, in addition to mobilization, is how individuals project power. So it's what the military call reach. And we're talking about everything from primitive little things like quadcopters with explosives on them or very cheap and accessible facial recognition technology that can enable targeting. Um, all of these things are becoming more widely available and we're more vulnerable targets because you have the so-called internet of things, the connectivity of millions of devices, and they receive and transmit data without any human involvement. And so what is happening to that data is another element of our vulnerability. Uh, that's an, a hugely increased attack surface, not just between states and in traditional war, but also with respect to criminals and with respect to political violence. So that's the second big change is reach or projection of power. And then the third big change, and Branca has uh, referred to this, it's very important, and the work you're doing, Branca, I think is just wonderful. Um, the third big change is systems integration. So autonomy and artificial intelligence, simple forms of autonomy, and you know, very sort of simple, narrow, general, artificial, and not general, narrow artificial intelligence uh, can become much cheaper, more accessible, more potentially lethal in future decades. And it's not that countries are necessarily controlling these dynamics. So it used to be that you needed a national army to have those three things, mobilization, reach, systems integration. And what we're seeing now is it's no longer necessary. Frightening. 
Which countries, Branka, are most proactive, in your view, in um, seeking regulation? And which countries are opposed? Let's name and shame here. <laughs> yeah, I think Audrey is absolutely correct to point to the kind of the changing landscape that's happened with the impact on mobilization. That's also happened on the international stage, and I would say within the UN forums. What we've seen is really smaller countries uh, stepping up, um, maybe because they're seeing this sort of vacuum of leadership and recognizing the impacts of some of these technologies. So smaller countries have really recognized these impacts. So I'm, here I'm thinking of Austria, for example, this morning in the UN discussions, they said something along the lines of, you know, if, if something is technologically feasible, we should ask, is it desirable, right? So it may be the case that it's feasible, but it's not desirable. Um, others such as um, South Africa, Brazil have also been thoughtful about the removal of human control. Um, they're, you know, they've noted concerns about hacking, right? Something we haven't mentioned, but you know, all of these systems are very vulnerable, right? Um, and adversarial acts, um, just as these countries are, you know, developing their systems, other countries are developing ways to counter some of those uh, systems as well. And I, I've noted this in my time in these rooms at the UN, that many countries have, that have experienced conflict um, more recently seem to understand the need to ensure that these systems do not proliferate. So beyond all the other things that I've mentioned, there, there are also raised concerns about the fact that some of these systems could be diverted to non-state actors. And, you know, and the interesting thing that we've also seen is the role of civil society and tech experts continuing to raise these concerns um, against what I think are really large odds. Um, and we've seen this in the US, for example, with Google employees uh, refusing to work on Project Maven. We've seen um, this happening in other countries as well. Really I mean, people, individuals, and then organizing and stepping up to say that they don't want, you know, they didn't sign up to work at Google to work for the Pentagon. That, that was sort of one of the things that came out. The countries that are opposed, I think you're all, you know, you know who, <laughs> you know who to name and shame. Um, Russia has been very vocal and very loud in those forums, uh, you know, very, very loud in saying that, you know, we don't need any new regulation. Existing law is sufficient. Um, and, you know, this is this, they see this as an attempt to constrain them, I think, in many ways. Um, interesting case is China. China has supported the ban on um, offensive uses of autonomous weapons but does not support a ban on defensive uses of autonomous weapons. So we really need more clarity on where China stands. But at the moment, at least, it seems like it is open to dialogue. And I think, you know, in, a, in these discussions, international forums, we're always looking for those small openings. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, you know who to shame, but the other countries as well, I mean, one thing that I wonder about is Australia, for example, is why are they such techno-optimists? They're always going on about how systems are perfect and they can encode international humanitarian law. I'm like, have they never used a laptop or a phone in their life that failed on them? So yeah, the, you know, the discussions are going, going on still, so we might see. Um, and Canada, for the Canadian audience, has been very silent, much to my dismay. I expected us to come in with some sort of progressive uh, points, but we have not yet. Thank you so much. Uh, Jessica, the Outer Space Treaty is known as one of the first non-armament treaties. Um, so is armed conflict in space legal? Uh, are there rules in place to prevent it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the core of the Outer Space Treaty is really focused on the concept of peaceful uses of outer space. And the key objective uh, at the time when it was signed in 1967 the height of the Cold War was to prevent uh, the raging arms race from extending into this new domain of human activity. It was quite a, an aspirational and inspirational treaty. Um, but really, the only operative clause linked to arms control in space is a ban on the orbiting or placement of weapons of mass destruction, such as nuclear weapons in space. Uh, this was a huge concern, and it's really critical that it's not allowed, um, but it's really not enough. You know, the treaty says nothing about the use of conventional weapons. So, um, you know, I was doing research on the question, you know, did Russia fire a projectile in space? And then a key question is, well, so what? You know, is this illegal? No, even if such an activity did happen, it is not illegal. Um, numerous countries are testing anti-satellite weapons in space. Is this illegal? Absolutely not. Um, the laws that we do have stem from the UN Charter, uh, including the right to self-defense, which applies equally in space as it does on Earth. Uh, so no, there really are no rules in place to prevent armed conflict or an arms race in outer space. Um, for the last decade or so, the uh, China and Russia 
have been trying to get together a treaty that would ban, ban weapons in space through a focus on hardware. That has really stalled, mostly because we don't know what weapons look like. Um, others, particularly, particularly in the West, have really been trying to um, nurture norms of responsible behavior in space as a way to stabilize the situation, to prevent uh, miscommunication, mishaps, and accidental escalation, and to stave off the worst possible outcomes of this situation. Um, and what I'm noticing more is that practitioners are starting to think about how the laws of armed conflict and international humanitarian law apply to space. And that to me suggests that we've already lost the battle to keep space peaceful that was so integral to the Outer Space Treaty. Again, extremely concerning. International laws are only as good as the national will to uh, implement them uh, a bit closer to home. Melissa, what can this generation do to mitigate the threat from nuclear weapons? So obviously there's a wide variety of opinions about nuclear weapons and there's a huge portion of the world that believes that nuclear weapons offer deterrence and uh, have protected the world from World War III. And there is also a huge proportion of the world that believe that nuclear weapons uh, have more risk associated with them than security benefits. And generally these groups break down into two political camps, one that it supports nuclear weapons for deterrence and one that supports the disarmament of nuclear weapons. Um, those two camps have been getting farther and farther apart uh, the more we see the Cold War in the rearview mirror. So um, there's been a couple of effects. You know, first that uh, my generation and younger uh, does not remember the Cold War. Um, we do not remember how close we came in previous instances. And there are some people who believe that nuclear weapons are just normal. They're just the biggest weapons or the strongest weapons and don't think of them as being different fundamentally different than conventional weapons. Um, you know, when I went through my graduate education, uh, I studied at Columbia University where Kenneth Waltz uh, was uh, king on campus. And um, I think that there's an opportunity for this generation to re-examine our thinking on nuclear weapons, which was predominantly produced in the West predominantly produced by American and British thinkers, despite the fact that there are many other nuclear weapons states and unofficial nuclear weapons possessors who have um, their own idea of what nuclear weapons can and can't do. So no matter where you are in the world, I would suggest that you examine some of these truths about nuclear weapons and their use determine how you feel about the security that nuclear weapons provide um, or don't provide and take action. And I think there's two main avenues that, that young people can look at. One is political, one is to organize using some of the social media and other tools we've heard about earlier. Um, there has been a, you know, a tremendous campaign at the grassroots level to try to ban nuclear weapons as being illegal. This is a completely disruptive concept outside of the, non, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and it was led by ICANN and others who won the Nobel Peace Prize two years ago for doing this. Um, but the same can be said for those who believe that nuclear weapons have a deterrent capability. The thing I worry most is just a kind of agnosticism that allows us to drift into the future with nuclear weapons technology getting easier and easier and easier and, and no informed idea about whether they are useful or not. The second way I think that students can get involved is in the technical uh, side of things. So first, um, you know, we have to decide uh, how uh, nuclear weapons will be modernized or dismantled and we need the technical capability to do so. And because nuclear weapons are not cool anymore, if you walk around the national labs in the United States or other nuclear weapons areas, you will see the age of the average person being above 60 or below 30. And there's a huge gap. So even if your goal is to dismantle nuclear weapons, we have to rebuild the human knowledge and capacity to do so. 
And then I'd also invite people to not completely rule out machine learning in automization, but to consider uh, applications and verification of arms trees. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, great, great takeaways for us. Um, so let's look forward. Where do we go from here? Veronica, are there ways that you see these systems transforming security and warfare? Yeah, and I want to acknowledge Melissa's point. I mean, some of these technologies are incredibly useful for our lives, right? They, and they will be useful for arms control. They will be useful for diplomacy. Um, you know, we don't want to write off technologies altogether. Um, and I'm also, when she was speaking about nuclear weapons, I was reminded of the case of Stanislav Petrov. Um, I don't know if you know about the Petrov example, many do, but in 1983, right, he, uh, he sort of prevented a nuclear war. I think the New York Times headline was, the man who saved the world by doing nothing. Um, and the, you know, he decided his gut instinct was that this computer telling him that these nuclear weapons are coming towards Russia from the United States, you know, that they weren't as reliable, um, that they should be questioned. And his gut instinct said, you know, they wouldn't send five. They would send everything that they have in their arsenal. So now I'm thinking, what happens when you don't have a Petrov at the other end? Um, you know, what if that is an autonomous system deciding, you know, that this is an attack and that it is an attack that needed, needs to be responded to? I'm also thinking, what does this mean when you have younger individuals who've grown up with video games, and, uh, you know, and who are maybe more comfortable uh, or trusting of these systems, right? We have this, uh, this notion, this uh, notion of automation bias, right? We really do over trust computers. And I think we've all done it with GPS. We're going the way we shouldn't, even though we clearly know, but it's telling us that we're following it because Google must know better. And so those are my concerns, which really are, and, and they're stemming not from my own kind of analysis, but yesterday I was listening to a UN side event, which was talking about, um, application of AI and they were talking about using simulated data and it really struck me that we're gamifying warfare right that um, we're forgetting about you know that war is um, you know complex and there's a lot of noise in these environments it's an ever-changing uh, environment as well and there are profound impacts on civilians right and this is also touching on this trend that we've seen of remote warfare, right? Where militaries are unwilling to send a lot of troops anymore, right? They rely on local partners, they send drones, um, and that this is all sort of distancing us more and more uh, from the real impacts of warfare, making it, in my view, a, a concerning thing, because it does mean that we're lowering that threshold for entering into war. And I also think about the policing and law enforcement implications, right? I, I don't think that these technologies just stay in the military um, sphere, right? And I think we see that all around. And I don't know about your local police departments, but I'm not sure I trust my local police department uh, with employing any kind of autonomous technology. So I think there are very real concerns, all to say, um, that really need to be examined that are going to be profoundly transforming warfare. I mean, the fact that we're talking about simu using simulated data for war zones is something that I'm not sure the people making that kind of recommendation recognize what the implications are, at least not for the population on the ground that really bears the brunt of these conflicts. Thanks so much. These are really, really enlightening uh, views and comments. Audrey, over to you. Can we anticipate, just building on what uh, Branka was saying, can we anticipate which new technologies will spread and be used unexpectedly? Sure. Um, now, remember, I'm talking about technologies that are commercially driven and that are openly accessible. So um, this is in addition to the other state controlled technologies that I share our other speakers concerns about. But those that are commercially driven, it's actually reasonably straightforward to um, predict which ones are going to be uh, used in new ways in uh, violent, um, lethal uh, applications. So those that spread are those that are accessible, cheap, easy to buy, easy to use, transportable, can be hidden in a pocket or can be hidden in a basement, <laughs> concealable, and have multiple uses and are not cutting edge. So we're talking about the second or third wave of innovation uh, starting in the 1990s and, and um, coming to the present. And those that will be used in unexpected lethal ways are, again, uh, not cutting edge, but it's very important that they have symbolic resonance because that draws a greater uh, audience to their use. 
they're part of a cluster of other technologies. So to give you an, a specific example, like internet chat rooms that intersect with uh, additive manufacturing or 3D uh, printing that intersects with phones plus simple robotics and you end up with, uh, you know, reasonably effective uh, quadcopter or, or small drone that can, that can use uh, an explosive. But what's, what's really interesting though is remember that this is not the first time we've had a period of open technological innovation. And not to be the historian all the time here, but we can go back to the 19th century and talk about how it is that we got control of the huge wave of political violence and um, individual violence that contributed to the First World War. The anarchist, so-called anarchist wave had a lot of other types of ideologies in it, was driven in part by dynamite and high explosives. And Alfred Nobel was one of the most enthusiastic people in wanting to have structures and regulations and rules about how and when and where uh, dynamite should be developed and, and how it should be controlled when it was in um, transit. So it isn't that, they're, that we're at odds with commercial companies in terms of controlling the risks and maximizing the opportunities. We actually make it easier for them if they're not going to have disastrous outcomes. And, and what's interesting is that in Europe, the emphasis was on regulation and in the United States, the emphasis was on um, the commercial companies restraining themselves and also very interestingly enough, the railroad um, union uh, united against having uh, dynamite traveling on their railroad cars. So you can have very different types of solutions in different countries and um, you can still reduce the risks of having a disaster. Thanks so much. Um, Melissa, very quickly, how do we eliminate nuclear weapons? Oh man, <laughs> if I had the answer to that. <laughs> um, uh, I think some of the points I mentioned earlier uh, are, are worth revisiting briefly. And that is just that, um, you know, I think you need to form a political will and then you need to have the technology to verifiably go to low numbers then to zero, and then to stay at zero. And it's not simple. Um, so political will, uh, that needs to be done with both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. They need to decide it's in their own security interest or not. And then, um, you know, the technology side of things, I'm actually quite, I'm quite pro-technology. I know we're hearing about all the scary applications today. But we shouldn't wait for the political will. We should already be making a disarmament track that gives states the confidence to go to lower numbers verifiably. And so I think you know, the International Atomic Energy Agency already conducts on the ground inspections of peaceful uses of nuclear weapons. And they also use um, you know, satellite imagery. They use uh, open source information. They use uh, different types of uh, automation to help their analysts uh, have a, a more effective management of the sheer amount of data they have to uh, process. So uh, I, would, I would say that uh, focusing on the policy and the tech track are uh, the most powerful ways to go to lower numbers. Great, thanks very much. Jessica, loads of questions coming in about what practical steps countries can take on these things, especially to help prevent conflict in space. Um, so what would you, re you recommend in this context to countries like Canada, UK, and our partners out there? Yeah, I'm currently doing research that's funded by the Canadian Department of National Defense Mines Program to map um, what I call the existing normative landscape in outer space. Um, and to think about practical ways that those can be, <clears throat> that those good behaviors that we already know about, the things that make us feel safe already, can be better extended uh, to military activities. So keep supporting my work, could be one answer. Um, thinking of examples though, um, I, you know, what I find great about this research is it's so reassuring to see that there are already a number of things in place that I think we can build on. Um, some of those include better notification practices prior to military activities, such as maneuvering in space. Um, another one would be taking steps to ban or restrict the intentional destruction of objects in space, which creates the debris that I was telling you about. Um, you know, this, this I don't even find to be low-hanging fruit. I find this 
to be fruit salad, picking the things that we already have in place and, and putting them together into something really practical and feasible to improve security and sustainability in outer space. Um, I think other things, uh, there's a new initiative by the United Kingdom that was just launched at the UN this fall. Uh, they're trying to restart the dialogue on space security at the United Nations uh, with a focus on talking about the things that make us feel unsafe or feel threatened in space. And I think going back to this type of bottom-up, frank and open discussion is really a good place to start. Uh, really, we have to start somewhere. Thanks. Great, thanks. Audrey, questions coming in about um, you know, Biden possibly getting elected in November and what are the chances of New START being extended? Will the US security community support an extension on perhaps even the deepening of a New START or a new treaty on tac tactical nuclear weapons um, given the modernization program already ongoing in the US? Any, any views on that? I think it's likely that there would be much more enthusiasm for that kind of arms control in a Biden administration, but I certainly don't speak for his campaign. Uh, I, I do think that he has a very different approach and those that are uh, supporting him in terms of advising him on national security are much more oriented toward enthusiasm for arms control. Okay, Melissa, I want to come to you on that issue and also uh, on another question about limited nuclear warfare using tactical nuclear weapons that's been part of the Russian doctrine since the late Cold War, under the assumption that NATO states would be unwilling to respond with strategic nuclear weapons. So could the addition of new tactical nuclear weapons and an increased capability for limited nuclear warfare that you were all talking about serve to better deter the nuclear strikes at the tactical level, or is mass strategic retaliation still a sufficient deterrent? Great question. Yeah, so on the extension of New START, uh, it seems like it's, I mean, there's a flurry of discussions even here in Vienna in just the past few days between the US and Russia talking about this very issue. Um, I don't see a bright future for New START under Trump if, um, if it's possible to get a short-term extension. Uh, that may be the best we can hope for. Uh, and this is the same as we've seen with the INF Treaty and others. On limited tactical nuclear war, I definitely think that there is a lot of theory without data to back it up that limited nu nuclear warfare could happen. Uh, it's never been tested. And I think the biggest issue and the reason I don't personally find it a very compelling argument is that um, there is one, no really excellent way to discriminate between a nuclear uh, a, nucle a nuclear weapon carrying missile and a non-nuclear weapon carrying missile so you have what's called a discrimination problem and if you see you know if, if Stanislav Petrov saw five coming in today he may think oh here comes the limited nuclear warfare and still launch a retaliation unfortunately um, and because that edge is so fine most states publicly say massive retaliation is what they would do. And when it comes to push to shove, it's very likely massive retaliation is still what they would do. So I, I don't believe in limited um, tactical nuclear warfare. Thank you. And Jessica, along these lines too of mutually assured destruction, there's a great question which asks if um, you would see any motivation from states in developing a non-proliferation treaty in space or extending the reach of the current NPT to include non-nuclear space weapons. Uh, considering outer space is only meant to be explored and used for peaceful purposes, um, how might the international community hold countries responsible for violating international law around weaponization and militarization of space? Yeah, I saw that. It's a boondoggle of a question. Um, I think the NPT and the Outer Space Treaty are really separate, so I wouldn't see extending the NPT. Um, the good news is that nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction are banned from outer space, and I haven't seen any evidence of states keen to go down that road because it's, it's a nightmare, it's a disaster. So that's good. Um, there has been interest for about four decades in trying to have a, you know, an arms control agreement in outer space. The hiccups have been... Um, 
Some of it's strategic, it's linked to missile defense, which we haven't really talked about in this conversation. That's a whole other discussion, um, but the strategic link between space and missile defense makes it hard for some states to want to even discuss restrictions on what they could put in outer space. Um, I do think that the momentum building around norms of behavior, so not focusing on what is put in space, but what actors do with what they have in space, um, not threatening others with what they have in space, I think that's encouraging. And I'm hoping long term it would build, um, build to something more, uh, more legal and more long term related to arms control. Thanks so much. Um, Branka, can I ask you uh, a final question um, before we start wrapping up about questions coming in about the post-pandemic era? Will this provide an opportunity to ban next generation weapons, do you think, um, especially bioweapons? I'm an optimist at heart, so I hope that we do take this moment really to recognize that the kinds of challenges we're all facing, and I think there's a question on climate change as well, we're facing these enormous challenges that investments in these technologies could be diverted to addressing those kinds of issues instead of building these weapons. Um, I don't know if that the political will is necessarily there. Or I think we all see the state of global politics and really are questioning if, if there is that level of recognition and support. Uh, but I think we, we all need to ask for it because I think we're all dealing with the impacts of this um, and profoundly experience it. Thank you. Now, just a quick tour to Tavla. Policymakers in the audience today, what is um, the thought that you would like to leave for them for their consideration? Melissa, let's start with you. I, I think that we should build ethical thinking into our engineering and uh, computer science and uh, physics curriculum. I think that just because we can build it doesn't mean we should. And I think a lot of unintentional consequences, great ideas, uh, you know, may not consider the weapons possibility. So I would introduce that. Thank you. Audrey, your thoughts? Yes, I agree very much. In fact, we've been teaching uh, courses on ethics and um, practical problems, risks and opportunities of emerging technologies at, um, at my university since uh, spring of 2019. And I'm very keenly and actively involved in all of that. But I think in addition to um, Melissa's recommendation, I think we, we need to educate our representatives. I think we have to have more outreach and we have to have more interaction with those who are representing us in democracies, because I see a particularly dangerous period now for democracies that are caught in a pincer movement between autocracies and, and, and sort of, you know, anarchical situations. And so if we don't begin to recognize and have our representatives see that questions of privacy, control of data, search and seizure, all these basic governance questions are under, under assault right now, we're, we're going to have a difficult future. But the good news in any crisis like ours today is that every crisis does have wonderful opportunity in it. And so I'm an optimist too. Brilliant. Branka, last thoughts, 10 seconds. Uh, absolutely agree with everything Melissa and Audrey have said. And yeah, engage with this topic. This is not a matter that can be put off. Technology is outpacing regulation. Where tech is today is not where it's going to be. And if, you know, by the time these regulatory mechanisms are developed, develop clear positions on how you see your country using these systems. And absolutely, as Audrey said, reach out and educate uh, yourself and others, because I think these are, um, again, systems that are going to transform our lives. And Jessica, final recommendation from you. Uh, take space seriously. It's not science fiction and we need resources here. Space is powering military activity in absolutely every other domain. So we need to find ways to contain this. Um, if we lose space, if we lose it to armed conflict, if we lose it to debris, uh, it's really catastrophic for everyone else here on Earth. Thank you to all of you. That was a brilliant discussion. I'm sure the audience will agree. Honestly, keep up that super research. We desperately need it. And um, really, we're delighted to host you all today. Audience, we hope you enjoyed uh, this session and we hope you will join us for next week's session on October 1st at the same time, same link, for an equally interesting discussion on the future of work in a post-COVID world. Until then, take care and stay safe.